Pursuant to order, the Senate will move to valedictory statements, and I call Senator Di Natale. Well, thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, let me begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land I am speaking from today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose land our national parliament meets, and the traditional owners of the lands from right across the country. Now, Mr. President, I hope you don't mind me saying that uh, after announcing my resignation, I'm going to share this with uh, the rest of the world. You sent me a cheeky text message saying that you, would, uh, you wouldn't kick me out of the Senate during my final speech. Now, um, I'm not sure how you're going to do that from Melbourne, uh, but I'm going to do my best to behave. Uh, I didn't expect that my final speech would take place in a virtual parliament from a lockdown city amid a global pandemic. It's a pandemic that's causing untold suffering and hardship across the world. It's a pandemic that follows a devastating summer of bushfires. And it's a pandemic that concludes my decade in this parliament. Over that decade, six different prime ministers have come and gone. Climate change remains a festering sore on our body politic. Economic inequality has been entrenched. Race politics has reared its ugly head again. And the gap with our First Nations peoples has grown. If ever there was a time for deep reflection and for a reset of our national politics, this is it. Like many people, Right across the country, I've had plenty of time to reflect these past few months. And I leave the Australian Parliament knowing that despite the turmoil of the past decade, our nation is a better place because of what we Greens have achieved. One of the first votes that I cast in this place was one of my proudest as we delivered the world's best climate laws. The Clean Energy Act was the result of the power sharing arrangement between the Labor Party the Greens and independents. And it showed what could be achieved when politicians ditch the partisanship and cooperate in the national interest. Not long after that, I was fortunate to be able to negotiate a $4 billion dental package to provide millions of children free Medicare funded dental care. How good's this, I thought? Thanks to the Greens, we had a price on carbon, we had billions of dollars flowing into renewable energy projects. We had the first stage of our dental care plan to roll out Medicare funded dental care to Australians across the country. In politics, just as in life, sometimes you don't know how good things are until they're gone. That power sharing arrangement may have been tarnished by former Prime Minister's quest for vengeance, but it was one of the most productive periods in the nation's history. The other government that followed is infamous for many reasons, but the jaw-dropping 2014 budget with its full frontal assault on Medicare and on schools is seared in my memory. It was like a horror story. Now, each, each election, millions of people vote for the Greens because they share our values, but they also vote for us to hold bad governments to account and that was never more important than during those Abbott years. I had the great privilege of taking on the leadership of the Australian Greens just as that government ended, and I like to think that those two things may have been connected. Leadership was a responsibility that weighed very heavily on me. As leader, I confronted successive conservative governments and spent much of my time fighting their attacks on the environment and on people doing it tough. But I'm also proud that along the way we achieved some real wins for people. Securing $100 million in funding for land care as part of our solution to the backpacker tax standoff was a good day. Before I was elected to Parliament, I often thought these things were the product of careful deliberation and a thorough policy process. But it was a chance meeting with the Leader of the Senate in the corridor that allowed us to achieve a great outcome for farmers and for the environment. It took a 28-hour sitting to democratise voting in the Senate 
after the Labor Party reversed their position and threw everything at us. The Greens' policy was based on the very novel idea that in a democracy, the outcome of an election should reflect how people vote, not on backroom deals between political parties. There were lots of wonderful offerings during that long and ugly debate that night, but listening to a senator compare the bill to his colonoscopy had me questioning my life choices. After years of campaigning against multinational tax dodging, we negotiated important laws that increased penalties on corporations for tax avoidance and profit shifting. Labor attacked us because the laws didn't go far enough. But when will Labor learn that you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good? Sam Gascari, of course, led the attack with memes and posters and even a billboard decrying Di Natale's dirty deals. Sam, of course, was an expert on the subject of dirty deals. Now, working across the political divide carries real risk for a party like ours. We didn't benefit electorally from the power sharing government uh, with, Gil with the um, then Gillard government, but we got some really important policy wins. Getting good policy outcomes on the rare occasions we negotiated with the Liberals also gave our rivals plenty of ammunition and it did cut across our own message. But I firmly believe that we owe it to the millions of people who vote for us to roll up our sleeves and deliver Greens policy for them. Leading our team in walking out of Parliament during Senator Hanson's first speech, rather than sit in quiet acceptance of her racist views, or worse still, shake her hand afterwards, is another proud moment. Within hours of doing that, our office was flooded with calls, mostly from people from the Australian Muslim community, many in tears just thankful that they were not alone. Often during my time in Parliament, I felt like I was shouting in the wind. But in that moment, I knew that our message of solidarity was being heard where it mattered most. I'm proud to have led the party that supported marriage equality long before it was a popular cause and worked tirelessly with campaigners from across the community for decades until it became law. Our work behind the scenes in exposing the corporate greed in our banking and financial sector was critical in helping secure a Banking Royal Commission. When we first advocated for a levy on the big, bank, big banks, the Liberals slammed us for our economy-wrecking socialist policies. A decade later, they introduced one. It gave me great satisfaction to be upstairs in the ABC studios of Parliament House doing our radio interview with Senator Patterson, freshly out of the Institute of Public Affairs, and now defending another sensible Greens idea. Greens legislation for a National Integrity Commission to root out corruption was rejected outright by both sides for almost a decade, but we finally won. Now it's time to make sure that an anti-corruption watchdog is up to the job of fighting corruption and not just window dressing. Medicinal cannabis would still be illegal in Australia if it wasn't for the Greens. It took our bill to gain cross-party support and joined press conferences with people like renowned Greens hater and LNP Senator Ian MacDonald for the government to finally start listening. We've been a lone voice in this place on sensible drug policy with reforms like pill testing, supervised injecting facilities and adult use cannabis. And I know there are MPs in that place who agree with us. I just wish they wouldn't find their, vo their voice only once they've left Parliament. The citizenship scandal that saw us lose two fine senators was one of my toughest times in, the, in that place. The first phone call from Senator Ludlam came out of the blue and it triggered a series of events that cast a shadow over the 45th Parliament. A Perth lawyer had been digging around and he discovered that Scott had left New Zealand as a three-year-old and had not renounced his citizenship. I initially thought the second call just days later from Senator Waters was a joke. 
she told me was she, she she told me that she was still waiting for legal confirmation, but she believed that she'd unknowingly held Canadian citizenship. Well, the legal advice was clear. They were both ineligible to sit in Parliament. It's a, an archaic section of our constitution. It needs to be changed, but, but there was no question about what to do next. In the space of a week, they'd both resigned and I'd lost my two deputy leaders. We'd let down our members and supporters. The Prime Minister called us sloppy and extraordinarily negligent. The right-wing media went into overdrive, as they do. Of course, we all know what happened in the weeks and months that followed. Politicians from all sides were outed, except this time there were delays, denials, blame, and expensive high court challenges at the taxpayer's expense. It's one thing to talk about personal responsibility in this place, it's another thing to demonstrate it. So I leave here feeling incredibly proud of our team who have behaved with integrity and achieved so much. I leave with a deep sense of personal fulfilment that comes from fighting for a cause bigger than yourself. But if I'm being really honest, I also leave knowing that successive parliaments in which I've served have failed to achieve lasting reforms on the things that matter. Climate change, homelessness, job insecurity, mental illness, protection of our environment. It's easy to put these flaws down to the personal failings of individual prime ministers, but the failings of the past decade are much bigger than that. The very structures that underpin our democracy, many of them established a century ago, have been incapable of responding to the challenges before us. We're currently living through a pandemic for which we were warned but unprepared. A national medical stockpile was inadequate. Health workers were unable to get masks. And we lacked the basic capacity to make our own. Victorians are now locked up in their houses because of the failure of a quarantine system that failed due to a culture of outsourcing and privatisation. Ongoing outbreaks in aged care facilities have revealed the ugly truth of how we care or don't care for the elderly. We were warned about the threat of the global pandemic. And we've been warned time and again about the threat of catastrophic climate change. Yet the coalition, the Labor Party, the business community, and even sections of the union movement are divided over this issue. Despite having the technological tools to address it, despite significant public support, despite a litany of climate-fuelled disasters, they remain incapable of reaching internal agreement. The Liberal Party once believed in protecting the environment, in the notion of conservation. Today, they're dominated by a reactionary rump that represents corporate rent seekers that want protection from technological change like renewable energy. Today, with the climate crisis spiralling out of control, Labor's climate policy is weaker than it was a decade ago. Now, the Labor Party lost me many, many years ago but they're going to lose a lot more people if they don't muster up a bit of courage and take a stand on climate change. The Business Council worked hand in glove with the Abbott government to tear down our climate laws, only to leave their members hopelessly exposed to the risks posed by climate change. All they offer now is lip service in support of climate action, but criticism of anyone with a meaning, meaningful plan to do something about it. And during last year's election campaign, we had a powerful mining union in Queensland forcing candidates to sign a pledge in support of coal mining and denying them a chance at a long-term future. Not so long ago, our major newspapers would hold these institutions and our political parties to account. Today, they host fundraisers for them. The dominant Murdoch media continues to shamelessly promote climate denialism. And the ABC has been worn down by relentless attacks and ongoing budget cuts. 
Social media, which was getting started a decade ago, promised to take power away from media moguls and to democratise debate by giving citizens a voice. Instead, it's become a platform for extremes, where conspiracy theories flourish, and where anonymity plays to the worst of human instincts. Our institutions no longer reflect who we are or who we want to become. We urgently need a new era of sweeping political and economic reform. And it has to start by making our democracy work for people and not corporations. The first political fight I saw up close in this place was watching a cashed up gambling lobby descend on Parliament House like a pack of vultures and shamelessly sink popular pokies reform. Since that time, I've seen the same story play out over and over and over again, whether it's the mining tax, alcohol regulation, or action on climate change. The formula they use is always the same. Keep the donations flowing. Deploy an army of lobbyists, preferably politicians, so they can exploit their connections. Post fundraisers. Run big campaigns against anyone who threatens your bottom line. Pay thousands to get a seat at the minister's table. And the bigger the check, the better the seat. That awful new fence that surrounds Parliament House now is symbolic of this rotten culture. We've closed off the building to the community, but we've thrown the gates wide open to vested interests with deep pockets. A representative democracy should represent the full diversity of its citizens. Instead, ours represents a political class who tread the well-worn path of student politics to political staff to parliamentary politics. Our parliament and the Australian nation are two different countries. We need more women, more people from different cultural and economic backgrounds, more young people in our parliament. It shouldn't take a pandemic to force the introduction of technologies like the one we're using right now, which is going to make it easier for parents and carers people with disabilities, people from rural backgrounds to engage in our democracy. Our parliament's not representative of how people vote either. The National Party, with about 4% of the national vote, returns 16 lower house MPs. The Greens, with almost three times that vote, returns one MP. Yet for nearly two decades, a tiny, overrepresented anti-climate party has been crucial in blocking action on climate change. If we have proportional representation so that our national parliament fairly represented the wishes of voters, climate change debate would be largely over. This pandemic's demonstrated the critical role of looking after people. We've got to get our democracy working for people. Pandemics also expose the lie that government can't support those in need. For years, the low rate of New Start condemned people to a life of poverty, and that's only changed because millions more Australians have been forced to live that reality. We now effectively have a universal income, and it should stay. We've been gradually heading towards a two-tiered, privatised, American-style health system, but we know the best insurance against any pandemic is Medicare and our precious public health system. The crisis has again exposed a tough reality for people in insecure and inadequate housing. We need a massive new bill of public housing, which would create jobs and investment. Online communication has been critical for people during this period of isolation, keeping people connected, allowing businesses to continue functioning. It's now an essential service. Free access to high quality internet would give many more people opportunities to flourish. And real action on climate change is nation building. Phasing out dirty, expensive coal fired power and gas and replacing it with renewable energy means thousands of new jobs. There are jobs too in building network infrastructure, new storage systems, and the electrification of our transport system. Investment in revegetation, investment in
Sorry, Senator Di Natale. Um, we might just. Senator Di Natale, if you can hear me, we are having trouble hearing you. We might, might just give it 10 seconds um, and I will have my office call IT. Pause, if you could pause for a moment, Senator Di Natale. Yeah, um, yeah, please, Senator Cormann. I'll just get my to, to, to assist the, the chamber, if we can just have a brief suspension, I seek leave to move a brief suspension until Senator Di Natale can resume. Uh, I'll put that, although opinion to say aye, the contrary no, it is suspended until the ringing of the bells. I'm looking at the clerk for the correct words. I will have my office contact IT. And they've confirmed they are. Senator. It'd be wonderful to have a functioning NBN right now. Um, uh, I'll, um, perhaps I'll just I'll just reflect on the disappointments of the past few decades. Um, I do I do leave Parliament, Mr. President, hopeful that things will change. I do, 
Unlike the response to climate change, state and federal governments have ditched the partisanship and have been guided by evidence in responding to this pandemic. It's absolutely true, some terrible mistakes have been made and, and they deserve scrutiny. But I also want to acknowledge the many sensible life-saving decisions too. There's also a strong sense of solidarity in the community. It's been a really, really tough year for many people. Many people are struggling, but the vast majority of people understand that this shared sacrifice is required to get us through this together. It's also a moment where people have been given space to think deeply about what's important in life. We're social creatures. We rely on human contact. We rely on each other. It's a moment like this that puts a lie to the dog-eat-dog -dog rampant individualism that has formed the basis of our politics for far too long. I'm optimistic because social movements are building around the world too. And throughout history, it's these movements that have driven change. Right now, collective action on climate change, racism, sexism and inequality is gathering steam. I remember leaving Parliament especially demoralised after a particularly brutal sitting week. And it was the tens of thousands of passionate, engaged young people at the climate strike the following day that gave me the strength and energy to keep fighting. I want to thank them. I leave politics feeling confident about the Greens too. I joined the Victorian Greens two decades ago. We had no state or federal representation. And over what is a short period of time, we've elected dozens of state and federal MPs and local government councils right across the country. Our party is strong and resilient. We have the support of millions of Australians and we're the only party with genuine solutions to today's problems. That doesn't mean we can't do better. We need to continue building a culture of accountability and respect. It's easy to focus on yourself or perform for a small and noisy crowd, but success lies in reaching outwards and engaging meaningfully with people from right across the community. And that's what our members and supporters and volunteers do every day. None of us would be here without their commitment, their passion, working tirelessly, giving their time, sharing their ideas, and talking to real people to get more Greens elected. To everyone that's knocked on doors, made calls, stood on polling booths in the middle of winter, demanded change at rallies, shown solidarity at vigils, and done so much more to make this country better, I want to thank each and every one of you. To all of my staff who have worked so hard for so long this past decade, Thanks so much for the long hours, the weekends, the travel away from home, the pep talks, the wise counsel, and just for listening to me whinge. I'm not going to name anyone today, but you know who you are, and I will be forever grateful. To my team of wonderful Greens MPs, thank you for your unwavering support. You are all incredible human beings, and it has been a privilege to lead this incredible thing. To Adam, you're going to do us proud. To other MPs across the political divide, I know that most of you are here because you believe in making Australia a better place. And I genuinely wish all of you every success in making the next decade better than the last. To all of the people who keep our parliament functioning, the clerks, the Senate attendants, the cleaners and the gardeners, thank you so much. To the comp car drivers with whom I spent many a long drive, just thanks for your company. It's been a privilege. And to my family, Lucy, thank you for your incredible support these past 10 years. I could not have done this without you. And I hope I can support you in your career, just as you have done in mine, as we raise two fine young boys. To my boys, time to get the footy boots out because your old man's back in town. To my mum and dad who've ridden every bump along the way in support of their little boy, thank you 
for all of your love. And thanks, Mum, for all those packages of lasagna that I managed to sneak into Parliament House. In my first speech almost a decade ago, fresh-faced and optimistic, I quoted Martin Luther King, who said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Now older and greyer, after a tough decade in Parliament, my faith in that idea is a little shaken, but not broken. Sure, there have been some setbacks this past decade, but it will bend towards justice again. It will bend because we will bend it together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. Um, and thank you for your understanding. Senator McKim, I was going to call you just for a moment. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I just seek leave to have so much of uh, Senator De De Natale's speech that was inaudible recorded in the Hansard. Seems reasonable. Leave, leave granted. Senator Cormann. <coughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I rise uh, to acknowledge and uh, to congratulate uh, Senator Richard Di Natale on uh, his service to the Senate and to the nation. As a Greens Senator for Victoria for 10 years and uh, as the leader of the Greens for five years. Uh, we would often disagree on during debates uh, in this chamber and indeed during debates uh, in the lead up uh, to uh, various elections in which we were uh, both candidates. Uh, in fact, I've disagreed with much of uh, what Senator Di Natale had to say in his speech just now, in particular about uh, the performance of our government. But outside the battles in this uh, chamber, I have always found uh, Senator Di Natale to be an unfailingly courteous, professional and trustworthy uh, partner to engage with. Um, there is much which can be achieved on the foundation of trust, uh, even and in particular across uh, party lines. Uh, including in sitting down, I guess, in the government's uh, senator's uh, lobby uh, to what apparently Senator Di Natale uh, thinks was an impromptu uh, catch-up, uh, but which was, of course, uh, absolutely organised. Uh, and, and I have to say, um, Senator Di Natale and Senator Rich Wilson at the time uh, did um, approach this issue uh, that we were dealing with at that particular point in time, the backpack shop, back, backpacker um, tax uh, arrangements, uh, with a very constructive, positive um, attitude, seeking to find a, a, a sensible resolution, perhaps not uh, perfectly uh, what the Greens would have been looking for, but nevertheless a, a, a more sensible landing rod. And of course, in that context, we also reached agreement uh, in relation uh, to $100 million in additional funding uh, for uh, land care, which was secured by the Australian Greens as part of that discussion at the time. Another issue uh, on which I personally was uh, very closely engaged on with um, Senator Di Natale and Senator Liriannan at the time too, who was the Green spokesperson uh, on electoral matters, uh, is the whole issue of Senate voting reforms. Um, I think we ended up with about, you know, just short of 40 hours of debate, including more than 20 hours uh, straight uh, on a Thursday afternoon, uh, I think at 4.30, from 4.30 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon, we resumed the debate uh, on uh, the Senate voting reforms and we finished somewhere around one or two on the Friday afternoon. And, uh, you know, I would have much rather, um, after an appropriate time, uh, brought the debate to a clo close with, uh, you know, the traditional uh, time management motion. Uh, but as we were going through quorum call after quorum call at 1, 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Senator Di Natale was holding firm uh, to the principles of democracy and that this issue had to be uh, divided out properly. And I mean, it was an important reform because up until uh, that time, uh, until the Senate uh, agreed to endorse that particular reform to Senate voting arrangements, uh, it was um, so-called preference whisperers uh, that were dealing and uh, trading the um, second and subsequent uh, voting uh, preferences of Australian voters uh, behind closed doors in so-called group voting tickets. And uh, the reforms that the Greens and, and the government together uh, put in place uh, through uh, that particular uh, piece of legislation put the power not just of, uh, over the first 
uh, voting preference, but over any subsequent voting preference when voting for the Senate to where it belongs into the hands of every individual Australian voter. And I, I think that that is a reform uh, that Senator Di Natale um, and, and the Greens, uh, together with the government, I think will be able to continue to look back on uh, with, with great pride. Uh, I sort of did a bit of research uh, you know, in preparation for this, um, sort of looking at uh, Senator Di Natale's background. And I see that he, like me, is born in 1970. Uh, so we're both, well, he has turned 50. I'm turning 50 in a couple of years' time. 50 is clearly the new age at which to retire from the Senate. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you know, interesting, interesting. But the other thing, I guess, that Senator Di Natale and I have in common and, and Senator Wong have in common as uh, leaders of parties in the Senate is that we are uh, all three of us from migrant backgrounds. And it is a great demonstration of um, the wonderful migrant, uh, multicultural, a society that, that Australia has become, that uh, leaders in this place for, for three uh, parties um, uh, making contributions uh, through this place are indeed uh, for, from a, a migrant background to Australia. Um, in um, Senator Wong's case, in my case, first generation, and, and in Senator uh, Di Natale's case, second, second generation. Um, I absolutely wish Richard and his wife Lucy and their two boys, a, a happy, healthy, uh, satisfying future. Um, and on behalf of the government and liberal senators in this uh, chamber, congr congratulations, uh, Richard, on your contributions uh, to our vibrant democracy over the 10 years that you have served uh, with uh, distinction in this chamber. Uh, and yes, uh, I mean, best wishes for your future. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I rise on behalf of the Labor Party to acknowledge the valedictory remarks of Senator Di Natale and to reflect on his contribution to the Senate. Having served over just, nine, just over nine years in this place, elected as a senator for Victoria in 2010, taking his seat in 2011. Uh, Richard has made a particular impact in areas including health policy, multiculturalism and, of course, for five years as leader of the Australian Greens. He was, when he entered the parliament, one of a new wave of Greens senators. It was a high point, the 2010 federal election for the Greens electorally. The party increased its representation from three to nine after returning a senator from each of the six states, including Senator Di Natale, and that gave them the balance of power. It placed Senator Di Natale in the national parliament at a significant time for his party in his home state and in Canberra. He was the I think the first Green Senator elected by Victoria. Senator Richard Di Natale has been uh, the Greens representative or spokesperson on health policy throughout his time as a senator. And I recall sitting here for his first speech uh, when he spoke of his experiences in medicine, including working in community health as a general <coughs> practitioner in Aboriginal health in the Northern Territory and with the Nossal Institute for Global Health. This knowledge and understanding of how health policy affects people at a practical level and in significantly disadvantaged communities in particular has been evident in his approach as a parliamentarian. In the way he sought to advance policies with a focus on prevention, recognition of the fact that so many of the illnesses he had been called upon to treat were entirely preventable. He also recognised that many of the factors that influence health and well-being lie outside our health system, and that, impro that improvement in areas such as housing, water, sanitation and involvement in community are critical indicators. Individual health is inextricably linked to the health of our society. It's something that Senator Di Natale brought to his work. It's something that is worth all of us reflecting upon and something illustrated in the current pandemic. One aspect of Senator Di Natale's political leadership I wish to reflect on is his support and advocacy for a multicultural Australia. Well, we start part oh, here we are. Order. I think we've got you back now, Senator. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Wong. I think Senator Waters just came back online. We lost the system for a while. One aspect of Senator Di Natale's political leadership I wish to reflect upon is his support for and advocacy for multicultural Australia. This is at the core of his own identity. In his first speech, he reflected on the journey his parents had taken from Italy to settle in Australia. His mother is a young girl with her parents and his father is a 29-year-old man. Their migrant story is one echoed by so many Australians of multiple generations 
was people who combined hope for a new future with hard work to build their lives in a new country. And he reflected that from these beginnings, his family has contributed teachers, doctors, factory workers, builders and lawyers, and a senator. He was right to say that multiculturalism is one of Australia's enduring successes and an opportunity to focus on those things which unite us. He named respect for our democratic institutions, for universal human rights and for equality of opportunity. Its intrinsic value, he noted, comes through the relationships formed with people from different cultures, offering, as it does, important insights into our own. And throughout his parliamentary career, he has emphasised the importance of multiculturalism, including in his leadership of the Senate Select Committee on Strengthening Up Multiculturalism. And as Labor senators stated in their additional comments to the report of this committee, leadership from the parliament is an important factor in multiculturalism and its success, because we all have a role to play, collectively and as an institution. We have the opportunity in this place to shape community norms, and we all have a responsibility to encourage cohesion in the Australian community. Regrettably, there are some in this place who seek to use race as a political weapon. Despite everything history has taught us about where that leads and despite the pain and trauma that inevitably brings to fellow Australians, Richard Di Natale has always resisted these forces and he has been a consistent opponent of political efforts to sow division on the basis of race. He has been a voice for an inclusive Senate and an inclusive Australia and I thank him for this. Senator Richard Di Natale served as the Greens leader from May 2015 to February of this year. And he knows any leader of a parliamentary party bears a significant responsibility. You see, some of the things we deal with are clear, but most are nuanced. The simplicity of the stories politicians tell can often conceal wicked complexity, because most of our decisions ultimately involve trade-offs. It was to the Greens' credit that they finally embraced those trade-offs in engaging with former Prime Minister Julia Gillard to put a price on carbon. Now, the full extent of, the, of Senator Di Natale's influence on this is something we may never know. But I do note that the climate package the Greens supported under Prime Minister Gillard was one that gave more concessions to carbon-intensive industry, a browner package than the CPRS that I had put forward the Senate a couple of years before, and that the Greens voted with the Liberal Party uh, to defeat. The fact that the Greens voted with the Liberals against a less brown package before Senator Di, Di Natale arrived and then voted for a browner package, package after he arrived suggests he might have helped them come to see the need for a more collaborative approach if they want to get something done. You see, the stakes were too high for squabbling and still are. The climate emergency was bailing towards us and only action could avert the coming crisis. I would never want to say our words do not matter. They do, especially as senators. We need to choose them carefully. But ultimately, science doesn't care about how fine our words are. It only responds to actions. Doctors know when faced with a critical patient, they need to act, not wait for the perfect and miraculous solution. And in Parliament, as in life, we rarely get to choose between something we think is perfect and something we think is irredeemable. As recently in this, as this week, the new leadership of the Greens and Senator Di Natale himself today pointed to the Gillard years as a template. I would encourage them to recall that that period involved considerable compromise on their part, including in supporting a browner climate policy than the one they had said was too brown. I urge recognition that change only comes through finding common cause with people who are different and persuading those who do not agree with us. Anything less, and we are part of the problem we claim needs to be solved. I would hope this is a perspective that Senator Di Natale shares, because politics should not just be for performative, it ultimately must be substantive. Finally, I want to observe that Richard has chosen the timing of his departure from this place. It's not a choice all of us have the luxury of making. I hope he does so happy with what he has contributed and with energy and enthusiasm for what lies next. Hopefully it will involve much more time with his family, with Lucy and his two sons. And of course, some time on the farm as he desires. And recalling uh, the story he once told about uh, uh, his, um, his activities on the farm, 
I would just say to him, if you ever need someone to sample the next batch of salami or capicolo, remember there are a few vegetarians in the Labor Party. Can I say on a personal level, I have um, enjoyed working uh, not with Senator Richard Di Natale. We have uh, disagreed on much. Uh, he has always been decent and trustworthy in, in my private dealings with him. I wish him all the very best in his future endeavours. Senator McKenzie. Thank you much, Mr President. And I rise with some short remarks from the National Party uh, on the retirement of Senator Di Natale and associate ourselves, obviously, um, with the comments from um, the government leader, Senator Cormann. Um, it might seem a little odd, Senator Di Natale, that the Nationals um, wish you all the very best in your retirement, um, but we really do. Um, Senator Di Natale and I arrived here in the same batch of senators representing the same fabulous state. Um, and sharing a passion for the great code uh, being AFL, which I know he's looking forward um, to getting the boots on with the boys uh, after today. And it's a great privilege to serve um, uh, the, the great state of Victoria from what is often seen, and to be fair, other than probably two instances in our entire career, um, that we're at polar opposites um, politically. <laughs> But I think it's a great testament to this institution, to the people that are called to serve here, irrespective of their political persuasion, that at a time of a new senator's arrival uh, and a senator's deciding to retire, that we come together as an institution and respect their contribution because we recognise a cohort of Australian people sent them to this place to represent that set of values. And as uh, violently opposed to most of your values, uh, <laughs> Richard, um, the Nationals have been. And I know Senator Canavan recalls um, a time he offered his starter Dani T-shirt uh, as a jersey swap with your stopper Dani uh, T-shirt after a Q&A appearance. Um, so there is some friendly banter, etc. But we are here to do a serious things and to stand up for our values. But to be able to do that respectfully uh, and to acknowledge that we each bring um, a sense of purpose and a sense of um, drivenness, knowing that we're representing the needs and interests of people that have sent us here. So yes, we've disagreed on the role of coal in the mining industry in the Australian economy. Uh, we've disagreed on firearm regulation. We've disagreed on whether a sugar tax is the best way to combat um, the obesity epidemic. Um, but we have agreed that a pluralist pluralist democracies, um, the best place to raise our children uh, and to do our very, very best in, in uh, seeing out our service to our state. Um, I would like to thank uh, the former leader of the Greens, Senator Di Natale, for um, sensibly assisting Australian agriculture, um, get the workforce it needed and also getting a cool 100 mil out of Senator Cormann for a great program being Landcare, uh, which is a great pragmatic um, way to support conservation programs in rural and regional communities, with community partnering with farmers uh, to get great environmental outcomes. I recall that Senator Di Natale at the time said um, around seasonal workforce uh, in that debate, that if we do not remain competitive in this area, then Australian agricultural businesses are going to lose out. So, thank you, because that was a real point of crisis for rural and regional um, communities. Um, I wish he'd support other regional job providing industries out in the regions, and um, mining obviously is a key part of that and is something that we as a party uh, pursue uh, ad nauseum uh, and with good cause. But Senator Di Natale is also a great advocate of the role of sport in um, the broader Australian community um, as an integral part of the national character. Uh, and I loved his quote that AFL, in my home state of Victoria, the AFL occupies a space somewhere between sport and religion, and he's right. Um, and I hope he gets to enjoy a lot more of that in his time off. Um, so thank you for your service. Senator Dean Tully, I hope you enjoy some time with your family out in rural and regional Victoria, 
the South Great South West. I'll send you a membership form, a bit of time on the land out in the community. You might uh, appreciate the National Party's contribution here, but um, thank you for your service. The battle of ideas is so important, um, and we on our side and in our party absolutely value diversity of ideas, of which you've been a key contributor. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters has requested to go next, and I'm going to go to Senator Waters. I appreciate there are some time pressures. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. Um, and I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens with um, a real sadness to farewell a dear friend of ours, Senator Richard Di Natale. We're sad to lose him from our party room, but we are so happy to see the spring in his step and the ease with which a smile comes to his face these days. Um, and after 10 years in this place and five of them as the leader of a political party, it's no mean feat to retain your humanity, uh, your sense of humour, um, your sense of perspective and your compassion uh, for the world and for others. Um, Richard is a truly remarkable human being and I think I speak for many people, certainly I speak for everyone in our party room in saying that we're going to miss him dearly. He's a dear friend to all of us, and I think he has made an enormous improvement to the culture of the parliament and to this chamber. Um, I was really honoured to serve as his deputy leader, and I'm really sorry about the Section 44 thing, Richard, <laughs> um, for all of the stress that that caused you in what was a torrid time, um, but another situation that you handled with grace and with just an impeccable calmness and kindness. Um, Richard's gone through some of the amazing achievements that he has been proud to, um, to deliver in his time as leader of the Greens. I'm conscious that Richard has to leave um, in, in about 15 minutes, so I'm going to keep my remarks fairly brief because I know many of our other um, Greens team want to say their farewells as well. Um, but indulge me, the first time I met Richard was in 2007, um, when we were both candidates to become senators. We both missed out that time around, but we bonded um, actually over some um, terrible media that we'd both had at the time on a dodgy website. But perhaps I don't need to go into the detail of that. Um, but we then uh, entered the Senate in the class of 2010 together. Um, and have, I've continued to make wonderful um, memories of my parliamentary work with Richard, including eating Italian in Paris when we both went to the climate conference in 2015. Of course, we were eating Italian in Paris. It was Richard. Um, and then both, of course, meeting um, David Attenborough at that same visit and, and both being completely starstruck and, and tripping over our tongues. Um, getting to see his farm and to just watch the, the ease and the loveliness of, of he and his family uh, together. Getting to see a terribly bleached Great Barrier Reef um, on a trip that we both took after, I think it was the first bleaching event. There was then a subsequent one the following season. Um, and just sharing the grief of um, the starkness of that completely destroyed coral reef um, is another experience that I won't forget. Look, Richard's just an all-round decent bloke, and I, and I couldn't make a final contribution without acknowledging that I think everybody's mum is in love with him, um, and I'm pretty sure it's not just my mum, Richard, so the, you know, the Hansard has to reflect that. He really has a warmth um, and a good sense that I think encouraged people to uh, really consider what the Greens stand for and to, and to give us um, a chance and to trust us with their vote. Um, his, his achievements have been impressive. He's listed many of them, um, championing marriage equality, um, working for Medivac legislation, um, fighting for uh, an independent federal anti-corruption uh, watchdog, that money for land care, uh, leading our party to our second highest vote um, at an election in our history. Uh, the list could go on, but fundamentally, Richard is an incredibly decent human being. He is um, he's a really good person and we will miss his contribution um, and his, his considered uh, wisdom in our party room. I do also have a message from our uh, new leader, the wonderful Adam Bant, to convey to you and on the hand side, Richard. Um, Adam says, thanks for your amazing service to our movement over so many years. 
We're so lucky to have had you as a Greens warrior. You leave a great legacy behind and I'm sure there's much more to come. We can't wait to see what you do next, but hopefully it involves a bit more surfing, a bit more time with the family and a lot fewer late night phone hookups. We will miss you. Indeed, we will miss you, but we look forward to a lot more catch-ups outside this crazy life. Um, lots more pizza and probably um, some beer, but I'm bidding for non arancini balls because they're delicious. Can I sign off by saying um, thank you so, so much to Lucy and to Luca and Benji, your family, for, um, for sharing you with the nation for the last 10 years. We know what a sacrifice that is and we're deeply grateful for it. We're sorry to miss you and lose you, Richard, but we're so happy that your family's got you back. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, thanks, President. I, I, given the time pressure, Senator Patrick, I'm going to allow his party colleagues to contribute. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much, President. Well, Richard, a cracking speech, mate, right up there uh, with some of your best work. And there have been um, some absolute beauties. My favourite was the uh, hang your heads in shame speech, uh, otherwise known as the you should all be ashamed of yourselves speech, uh, otherwise known as you're all a disgrace um, speech. And Richard is um, far too modest to quote his own speeches, so I'm just going to quickly uh, regard the Senate with a snippet of, um, of his uh, probably most famous speech in a place. The context was the Liberals were um, uh, embroiled in uh, a leadership challenge which uh, ultimately saw the demise of uh, former Prime Minister Turnbull. And this is what Richard had to say at that time. It's a disgrace. It's utterly shameful. We haven't had a stable government in this country for a decade now. I've got a 10-year-old boy. He's seen half a dozen different prime ministers. We have politicians in this joint who are more concerned about themselves, about their own self-interest, than they are with governing the country. Just think, while the Liberal Party has been tearing themselves apart, we've got 100 per cent of New South Wales that's in drought right now. We've got the Great Barrier Reef on the brink of collapse. We've got a 12-year-old girl who's setting herself alight in Nauru. We've got kids who are in a catatonic state because they've given up hope, locked away in those offshore hellholes. What's the Liberal Party doing? Focusing on vengeance, on payback focusing on themselves. We've got people who can't afford to pay their medical bills. We've got young people being priced out of an education. There are 100,000 homeless people in Australia. There are women who fear going home tonight because one woman a week is killed at the hands of a violent partner. And what have we got? We've got this spectacle, this disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourselves. And boy, you did tee off there, Richard, and you really spoke on behalf of the millions of Australians. Who, uh, who supported uh, all of those things that you mentioned uh, and were ashamed at the spectacle that was going on in this place. Now, Richard would never forgive me if I didn't rebut uh, Senator Wong's political comments in her response to Richard's uh, speech and, in fact, her revisionist history. Uh, let's face it, the CPRS, the Continue Polluting Regardless Scheme, was uh, not a better scheme than the clean energy package. It was a much, much worse and browner scheme. If the clean energy package was still in place, Australia would be emitting far, far less than we currently are, whereas if the Continue Polluting Regardless scheme was still in place, Australia would be emitting far, far more than we are now, having not had a price on carbon for so many years, thanks to the Liberal and National parties. But Richard, I want to say uh, you have been an awesome senator, a fantastic and inspirational leader, and you always, always did what was in the best interests of the Greens and the millions of people who voted for us during your time in this place, and you did so even at significant personal cost. But more importantly, than that is your legacy as a truly beautiful human being who never lost your humanity, you never lost your humility, you didn't fall for the ego traps that get so many in this place, and you displayed always loyalty and consideration for others, and above all else, you are a truly honourable person. So, mate, it's time for you to get a few more waves down around the Bells region. Uh, your dodgy knee permitting, and I hope it's continuing to heal up. But more importantly, I'm sure you'll agree to spend much more time now 
with your beautiful family who you love so much. So go well, all the best, and uh, I'll see you for a few beers soon. I might take Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. Richard, over the last few weeks, I've seen you on Zoom and I've seen a few videos of yours on Facebook. And I must say, you look happier, more relaxed and carefree than I have seen you look in the last few years. And it's made it very clear to me that the decision you made to step out of parliamentary politics was absolutely the right one at this time. And you deserve to be relaxed and carefree after dedicating a decade of your life to our party in the broader progressive movement as a Green Senator, and not to mention years of service before that to the party. And you have my utmost respect for your passion and your humanity. I will never forget the very warm welcome that you and your team gave me when I joined the Senate two years ago. And it was your encouragement and your warmth that made me very quickly a part of our team. I've always found it very easy and very easy to be open with you as well. It's that such an important quality in a high pressure, high stress environment that we all work in. We've had our many agreements and we also had our disagreements. But you know what? We've never swept issues under the carpet and we've always come out stronger the other end. And I thank you for always listening to the other's point of view. The 2019 election, I must say, um, was a highlight for me, the campaign. The hard work of campaigning was done with real collaboration, with real friendship, and with a lot of fun along the way as well. And I'm so proud that together we really pushed the boundaries on social justice and on environmental justice. And you should be very proud of your leadership during that campaign that won us so many hearts and minds um, and all our senators back here. But one of the things that I will always remember you and thank you for from the bottom of my heart is speaking so unashamedly about tackling racism. You were never shy of calling out xenophobia, Islamophobia and racism. As a Muslim migrant woman of color who regularly experiences the searing heat of open racism, the dog whistling against migrants, and the damaging impacts of hate speech. I know speaking out is never easy, but you have done it with gusto, knowing you always had my back, and the back of other communities of color was both reassuring and very encouraging. And our party is now well set to continue to unapologetically demand racial justice. I'm sure that once you've had a break, Richard, we'll see some more wild and wonderful things from you, and I look forward to it. In the meantime, enjoy some very well-deserved downtime with your family. Thank you, Richard, and Khuda Hafiz, till I see you again. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to um, associate myself with the comments of, made by my colleagues in relation to Richard's departure. Uh, today. Um, I'm sad that Richard's not here to be able to um, experience it in person and to be able to give his valedictory um, in this place. Um, having said that, of course, um, Richard's always been um, uh, somebody who hasn't let his technophobia get in the way of being able to do his job. And I think this uh, particular um, uh, contribution and his valedictory um, is testimony to that. Um, Richard, I first uh, met you, of course, in the 2007 election campaign, and um, we don't have to go into all the gory details. But I was a brand new mum with a um, a baby on uh, in my arms who was um, five weeks old, and we were in Tasmania uh, at a um, kind of crash course on uh, Senate election uh, campaigning, and you were very helpful. Um, it was one of those things that, you know, travelling around this country with kids is really difficult. And that was my first experience, five weeks on, as a new mum, um, having to manage that. And you were right there, um, helping all the way. And I think that is testimony to how you have approached uh, your, all of your time uh, in this place, uh, serving not just um, 
your community, but uh, serving us as a party. And I know the contribution that you made to the Australian Greens beyond uh, the official leadership um, requirements has been enormous and very, very long-standing. Of course, Richard first ran for the seat of Melbourne um, long before he ran for the Senate. And uh, so there's kind of this, uh, he, he ran election after election until he got there. He was determined uh, to get to this place. Um, he missed out in 2007 in the Senate race uh, by a whisper. He knows what it's like to get very close, to work very hard and not um, get the prize at the end of it. But once he was here in 2010, one of the proudest moments I know um, experiencing um, the passage of that clean energy legislation. I remember how ecstatic Richard was, we all were, that we were finally getting climate action um, delivered in this place. And uh, it's, to, it's the testimony of the fact that we did very well in that election campaign, that we were in um, uh, that uh, position to uh, share um, in some of those decisions of uh, the Gillard government that we were actually able to make um, those changes. And um, Richard's always remained committed to that, that if you come to this place, if you work really hard as a political party to get yourself elected, you've got to be able to be practical and you've got to be able to look for the right outcomes. The balance with all of that, of course, is maintaining your principles and maintaining your commitment uh, to uh, the people who put you there. And I think Richard has always spoken very well about the need to be pragmatic, the need to get outcomes, but also uh, that uh, you don't undermine uh, or forget about why you're here and the real core reason um, of uh, the change that you want to make. Um, Richard, thank you for your service. Thank you for your leadership. Um, it's been um, an absolute hoot at times. It's been intense at others. Um, but your um, ability just to go with it and to keep going until the job was done, I think, um, is testimony to the type of character and man that you are. Um, just briefly, uh, before you go, I've got to say, sorry the AFL Grand Final won't be held in Melbourne this year. Uh, you know, let's bring, it, let's bring it to Adelaide and the Adelaide Oval, and I'm happy. I'm happy for you to have a spare uh, to, to sleep in the spare room at the house if you're desperate to go into quarantine just to watch it. Um, it's been a, a wonderful journey uh, working alongside you uh, with your leadership, and um, sorry you're not here for us to celebrate uh, now with a couple of drinks. Thanks. Senator Seward. I'll keep my. Um, words short because I know there's a number of people that want to speak and I have already expe expressed to Richard uh, my deep respect um, and appreciation for the leadership that he has shown over the years. One of the, one of the areas that I haven't mentioned previously and that hasn't really been mentioned here, although people have, uh, have articulated that, Richard, you uh, have worked in Aboriginal health for a long time, and, and it's one of our shared passions is ensuring that we are addressing Aboriginal health in this country. And I know that you spent a, lo a lot of your early medic uh, years in medicine working in Aboriginal communities, and I've had the pleasure of visiting some of those communities with you. I've seen the way that people responded um, to your deep commitment your passion and your care for the issue and your care for people. And it's been a pleasure to work with you on those issues. There's so many issues that you have uh, covered and that you have worked on. Um, I really appreciate the privilege of having worked with you of your, the leadership that you have shown. You are unfailingly supportive. Um, you always responded in a calm manner, manner whenever any crisis was uh, running, uh, other than in football. Um, watching the football with Richard <laughs> is uh, a, an experience. Um, Richard is absolutely passionate about Richmond. Uh, I'm a Dockers supporter, so there's at least one thing that we have never seen eye to eye on. You will now be able to watch um, a lot more football, because I know that you will have missed um, a lot. I've actually never seen you happier, really, other than when you're with your family, than when you are watching 
uh, football and shouting at the screen. It reminded me very much of my father-in-law's response when he's watching the Eagles not do very well. Um, so thank you for all the work that you have committed. I've also got a very personal thank you. When I, I'm trying to say this without tearing up. Um, when I had, and you know what I'm talking about. When I um, uh, got some very terrible news, you walked up to me and you just hugged me, and it made so much. It, it helped me so much. But it also, when I was sitting here thinking about that, reminded me about the fact that we can't hug our loved ones as much as we want to at the moment. And it, the power of that is actually really important, and I'd like us all to remember that in terms of what that means in these circumstances. And it also means that I can't hug you now, as I would do if we were all together and celebrating the amazing, amazing work that you have done in this place, which so many people have already articulated. So thank you for your years of commitment. Thank you for the decade, decade commitment you have made. I've watched you go greyer. I can hide mine, um, but I've watched you go greyer. Um, I've, I've witnessed your love and support for your family, and I'm so glad you'll be able to spend more time with them. And I also thank them for the sacrifice they made in letting us have you here in this place. I'm going to take the rare opportunity to make a brief observation myself, if I can, from the chair. Um, when any senator is here for a time, they all make their mark, but party leaders make more of a mark because of the consent of their colleagues that uh, elect them uh, and the role that they play in this place. I, I must confess I ha first met Richard a long time ago. I had the um, privilege of him well, running in the seat that I was a voter in for many, many times in the state seat of Melbourne. Um, and I must confess I didn't vote for Richard, but that won't surprise him. But um, when um, Senator Hanson Young mentioned that he missed out by a whisper in 2007, indeed he did, there was 0.78 per cent separating myself David Feeney and Richard Di Natale, and he just missed out on that last spot. What I will say I noticed at that time, living in that area, um, is that I don't have to share someone's political views to um, admire the fact that he played, a, in what my view as an outsider, was a strong role in building the Greens um, as a political movement in the inner suburbs of Melbourne as they were growing. He was there in the early days. I remember when they won their first mayoralty. Um, I think it was the city of Yarra and he was one of the people involved in building a political party. Now, civic involvement is something that I think we can all say is something we wish more people would undertake. So that in itself, building a political movement, um, is something that strengthens our body politic uh, and it strengthens democracy in this country. Um, I don't mean to sound trite, but I want to be brief. In many, this, way we, this place we all share a similar aspiration in so many ways. We want to see a society that provides opportunity. We want to see a society that allows people to be healthy um, in a better lived environment. We, we disagree on the means very strongly. We disagree sometimes on the priorities. Um, but importantly, Richard's represented a shared commitment to this place as the way to resolve those. Um, this place as a parliament, a national parliament. And as I've said before, this place is a Senate that represents a much more diverse set of views than the other place and plays a unique legislative role in that important aspect of compromise on which all democracy has to be based. Um, so we don't have to share views, we don't have to share a starting point, but sharing a process and a commitment to civic involvement, citizen engagement and this parliament is something very, very important. Um, I might also say that um, I can't really apologise, but if I had to pick someone I was going to have to ask to leave the chamber, it wasn't going to be Senator Di Natale at any point. Um, and he was very good natured about a very difficult time um, because I know that that was a moment of very strong feelings in the Senate. Uh, and I do know he genuinely meant the views that he expressed, and I understand why he did. Um, but sometimes being in the chair is not easy. Um, I'll conclude by saying um, when I had an illness, Richard contacted me a few times. I've always found him a profoundly decent person who cares for his colleagues, as those closest to him have, have said. Um, and I'm not quite 50, but I've obviously made the same decision. 
um, and I would just say to him, very best wishes for yourself, Lucy, and your boys um, after leading a political party, which is an extraordinary commitment uh, in our national parliament with the kilometres travelled and the time away from home. Um, I hope that they uh, have so much more opportunity to share the time that your colleagues have benefited from over the last decade. Senator, oh, sorry, I've got, oh, sorry, Senator Rice, I didn't see you there waving earlier. I would have let you go first. Senator Rice. Thank you, President. And I will also be brief. Look, I really did want to take the opportunity to thank Richard as a friend, as a colleague, as a leader, and not just over his decade in this place, but for the decade in the party beforehand. And sort of as a fellow Victorian senator and a fellow Victorian long-standing member of the Greens to work side by side with Richard for all that time. It's been really special because of Richard's collaborative approach. Richard, your integrity, your respect, your humanity, and basically your love for people and the planet and your willingness to just work together with people and to have retained all this through a decade in this place, which is a massive achievement. And Senator Seawitt talking about Richard's hugs brought to me too, just remembering when I got my tragic news last September, um, within minutes of Richard being in my office and just enveloping me in a, in a massive bear hug. Um, I want to thank you, Richard, for all of your achievements in this place, which we have you now you've talked through and other people have talked through. One that hasn't been mentioned is your love for our forests and your love and your passion for the future of the critically endangered Leadbeater's possum. I've had the great privilege of being the forest spokesperson for the Greens in my time in this place, but I knew Richard was just as much with me there in the forests and making sure that actions were happening to be protecting our precious wildlife. And then I want to finish by just thanking you for all of your unseen work. You know, having been side by side with you, seeing it um, to some extent going on. I mean, our party went through some tough times in your years as leader. Um, things like, you know, the, our troubles in Victoria. And so being there and seeing all the massive work that you did and how you handled those crises with your, your trademark fairness and respect, I mean, bringing people together. And so the Greens, this parliament, our country, our planet, is in better shape because of your contribution and bringing all of those wonderful characteristics to this place. And so I really want to thank you for it. And good luck. It's going to be um, terrific for you and for Lucy and for Ben and for Luke to be able to spend more time together. And just good luck with everything that you do from here on. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Rice. I'm going to give the call to Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. The, the first time I went surfing with Richard at Bells Beach, he, he lent me a surfboard. And I remember we paddled out and it was, it was actually a pretty big day. And surfing Bells, is, it's a bit like a giant football field. You've got to paddle about 100, 100 metres to get out to where you catch a wave. And I remember we were about three quarters of the way out and this giant set of waves started appearing on the horizon. And I didn't know if Richard could surf. And I just remember him saying, scraping over this giant wave, like trying to get over it as, as quickly as possible. And I thought, righto, I'm in the right spot here. So I turned my board around and I, I paddled really hard. And I remember dropping down the face of this giant wave. And just out of the corner of my eye, I spotted this blurred motion. And I thought, crikey, here goes. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kill someone because I just dropped in on someone else's wave. And it's turned out I didn't hit this person, but I don't know how I didn't. And when I popped up, I got thrown around for a couple of minutes and paddled out the back, and it was Richard. He, he wasn't actually scraping over the wave. He turned around at a better spot than me and had taken off, and I nearly committed a homicide for my uh, fellow party room member. Um, but actually, that's quite symbolic for me because when Richard started as leader, the day he started as leader, I gave him my, fam my favourite picture of a surf of a wave and a surfer on a wave and it was Bells Beach and I think it was one of the one of the biggest waves ever recorded uh, at Bells Beach and I said to him mate you keep this stick it on your desk 
And every time you feel like this, this job's overwhelming you, just have a look at that wave and, and have a think about, you know, what's going through that surfer's mind. And I know there's a lot of parallels. Just stay in front of that white water and stay on the face and go really fast and make sure it doesn't catch up to you. And, mate, I know it's been a really tough a tough few years and, and I would say this has been the most turbulent probably period in our, in our nation's parliament. And you've had your hand... Um, you've had your hand on the rudder for our party in some really, really big storms and you, you've got us through those rough years. And, yeah, thank you for talking about some of the things in the Senate today, mate. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. We've achieved a lot. Uh, and, you know, and, and I think um, Sarah's point is a really important one. Sometimes we do have to focus on uh, that mixture between pragmatic, pra pragmatism and, uh, and politics and, and get outcomes and... Yeah, mate, um, I'm looking forward to surfing a lot more with you at Bells Beach and spending more time with you on the farm, and I hope you bring your kids and Lucy down to Tassie, mate, and um, I'm sure our friendship's going to endure for some time to come. All the best, mate. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson and Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I'll say something very, very briefly. Uh, uh, Richard uh, was, a, was a good bloke, is a good bloke, and... Uh, yeah, no. But he's he's leaving this place, so uh, uh, okay. I didn't I didn't always like okay. uh, Richard's ideas, but I did really like the precision and the passion with which he delivered those ideas in this chamber. Uh, life in here is a blur; it's hard to remember all the things that that that, uh, that go on. And uh, people talked about the Senate sleepover. Um, I was in the back rooms. Uh, people may well in this place remember uh, Nick Xenophon wearing his pyjamas into the chamber and, uh, and that might strike as, a, as one of those things that you remember. Um, I wasn't here but I was the person that did the very, very late night run to, uh, to Kmart to get the, uh, the pyjamas from Bell Conan. Um, uh, it was about two o'clock in the morning or something. So you do, there are things that you remember in this place. and. It's, uh, uh, one of the things I'm going to remember is the day uh, that Richard uh, was asked to leave the chamber, and um, I say that noting that it's been mentioned by a few other people. And I say that very respectfully. I like a bit of public interest trouble being caused, and, uh, and I will remember that. Uh, good luck, and I wish you the best. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Is this on the valedictory? Senator O'Sullivan. I think that concludes the uh, valedictory. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution.